our very last speaker panel of the bootcamp. We really appreciate all of you guys for tuning in throughout the two weeks. And so we're here with our speakers today, Nina and Trisha. Uh, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, sure. Nina, you go first. Okay. Yeah, my name is Mina Corpus. I am a general assignment reporter at the Brockton Enterprise. Brockton's about an hour south of Boston, so I still work and live here in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of focus on local news, um, especially as COVID-19 became a thing. We all became health reporters overnight, um, even though that was one of my beats beforehand. And I'm originally from Bay Area, California. Well, so um, my name is Trisha Thadani. Um, I am a city hall reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I graduated in 2016 um, and was a member of the free for I think about three years that I was in BU. Um, so my I started out uh, at the Chronicle covering business uh, and immigration news, and I've since covered uh, since switched to covering city hall. Um, which has been a trip, um, and in today I'm have been pulled onto wildfire coverage. Um, so you'll kind of see me working in the background um, on that. But yeah, and Trisha might have to leave early just because she's doing very important work um, covering the fire. So yeah, um, that, right. um, so yeah. Firstly, how did you guys really like? find an interest in journalism kind of what helped you step into this field uh, yeah so i guess in high school i was i really always liked english and you know keeping up on current events i was kind of just trying to find out what i was good at and what i'd actually want to do and at one point one of our teachers asked like so what are you going to do like are you going to join the military are you going to become a doctor like how are you going to help people and i'm like I like writing things and reading, so let's try journalism. So I joined some high school journalism classes, and then by the time graduation rolled around, I thought maybe I'll go to a school like BU and, you know, try writing for the student newspaper and majoring in journalism, see if it works. And it seemed to have worked, so that's where I am now. Yeah, mine was kind of similar. Um, I had always, uh, you know, was writing personally, would write little short stories and just always kind of had an interest in writing. Um, and as I grew older and kind of learned what journalism was, um, I was really taken by the fact that it's just like a vehicle to see the rest of the world. Um, and I know that, you know, it's kind of like a cheesy thing to say, but it couldn't be more true. I mean, the amount of things and things you get to see, the people you get to meet, the perspectives you get to learn just by virtue of writing about it, um, I think is like one of the greatest gifts. Um, I mean, I moved to San Francisco four years ago and I feel like very like intimately connected to it because it's a place that I'm writing about and I know all the different players and, and the people. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a great job to be doing. One of my journalism professors, um, and like I guess a famous quote about journalism is it beats working. So it's, yeah. Yeah, and I just want to remind the attendees um, anywhere in the session, feel free to drop some of your own questions in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, so can you guys tell us about how your own college experiences led you to getting your first journalism job after graduation? Yeah, I would basically owe my career to the free because that's where I got all of my hands on experience, like right out of the bat, you know, joining first semester or freshman year, you know, staying on to write and then eventually becoming an editor. I got to do a lot of the things earlier than you would get, would get to do in your classes. And eventually, you know, being that comfortable earlier on helped to get internships like within Boston and eventually some after graduation and then their connections of you know people from BU from the journalism program. I was able to get my first job um, in central Massachusetts. So I definitely think that you know getting joining the free and going that way is a really good foundation. And it's definitely worked for other you know alum as well. Yeah, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I do definitely owe my 
career to the Freep. I mean, working for the Freep, as you all know, is grueling. I mean, and it can be very thankless at the same time. And, you know, you don't get credit, you don't get paid, but um, it really is where you like learn the building blocks of, of being a journalist. And then it gives you a leg up to these other internships. So I, um, my stepping stone from the Freep was I took a semester off of college uh, to go do a co-op at the Boston Globe where they like really throw you into the fire. Um, and, you know, there was such a good track record of um, Daily Free Press uh, alumni um, being part of that co-op. So it had, you know, that like name recognition on your resume was, was really, on my resume was really helpful. Um, so yeah, that was, that's something I recommend that everyone from the Free uh, try and apply for because it's like the best training um, I think you can get at that age. Um, and then from there, I kind of like, internship hopped. I had nine internships before I got my full-time job after I graduated, um, which is excessive. But again, I think it prepared me to get hired as a staff writer just a few months after I graduated from college. But I mean, if I had to go back and trace the origin of being able to get all those internships, it was definitely the Daily Free Press. And so Trisha, I know, I know that you were opinion editor. And so how did you pivot from focusing more on opinion to hard news? Yeah, that's kind of like a funny diversion in my, um, in my resume, but I think it kind of speaks to a broader um, value that I have. So, I mean, I was like, as you all know, like the freak was taking over my life and like I was kind of trying to get out of it. Uh, I think it was my sophomore or junior year where I was like, I can't, do this anymore like I was I had like a two point something GPA at this point like I was like I need to focus on my classes and um I think I was like an associate editor before that and then the editor-in-chief at the time they like really needed an opinion editor and I was like I don't even know what that position does and he's like it won't be as much work like and you'll just get to like write more and you'll learn a different style of writing and it'll be just good for your resume and, I, and he was like I promise it won't take up that much time it took up 10 times more time um so you know it was kind of a fluke um that I had <clears throat> I didn't seek it out it was more it more came to me but I think that also taught me a very important value where um you should always in this field jobs are so hard to come by and um, that you should always be open to different types of things and it will end up helping you more in the future where you have this wider breadth of knowledge and, and skill set. Um, and you know, it's just important to keep trying out new things and not siloing yourself to, you know, I thought I was just like a hard at the time. I was like, oh, I just want to keep doing like breaking news um, and would have originally never considered doing opinion writing, but I mean, I don't want to go back to opinion writing, but I'm glad that I had that experience because it taught me more. I think it made me a better writer, et cetera. So in short, it was a mistake that I didn't plan, but I'm glad it happened. Yeah, so speaking of basically college journals and taking up all your time, um, did either of you experience burnout um, either as a student reporter or a student editor? And how did you deal with that kind of stress? Oh yeah, that, that was definitely a thing. Um, even though, like, I mean, I did climb the ranks of, you know, starting as a staff writer, becoming an associate, and then an editor, things were kind of a little, I guess, at hyperspeed at one point, because while serving as an associate editor, my editor quit. So they basically appointed me and the other associate to take over the, the city and campus sections. And I would have liked a little more time to, you know, keep doing that. But you know, I, of course I said, yeah, I'll step in, I'll do that. So that was, that more, that responsibility came with it, but I was also still writing pretty much like an associate editor. So it was really, it was a very exhausting time as a sophomore, but, you know, I kind of just sucked it up. You know, I commiserated with my other friends who were part of the free, I tried to make my weekends, you know, as relaxing as possible, you know, taking time for me sort of thing and still attempting to do my homework and everything. But there's definitely a way to balance it out. And I'm everyone I've encountered in the free was really pretty good time management balancing skills because it's just part of the job. You kind of have to 
learn how to do it or else it's gonna really get to you sort of thing. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, Mina's a good example of how being good can kind of be a curse sometimes <laughs> because I remember when I was an associate editor, there was like few competent stuff or few people as good as Mina. So every time I would get a story, I'd always be like, throwing at it at her and she was really great and you know always like rising to the challenge so um but yeah so burnout was totally real um it was really hard to balance both my grades and the freak just because of how much time um it took up my grades definitely suffered um looking back i don't know what i could have really done differently but I my advice would be to you know pay attention to your classes as well like now that I'm a couple of years out of college like I really regret not you know taking advantage of like the education opportunities I had to like learn about different subjects and stuff um and you know I think that ultimately it was it was worth it of all of the time and effort that I put into the daily free press but I think that there's this old sort of like old school journalism mantra where like if you're not burned out and kind of dragging yourself on the ground then you're not doing enough work you're not working hard enough you're not paying your dues I think that's kind of a sentiment in journalism that needs to change because this work is really hard and if you don't take time for yourself and pay attention to how much you're burning out, your work is just going to suffer. Um, I mean, I experience something like that now, even as a staff writer. Um, so it's just like, I think those conversations need to be more prevalent in our field of just like paying more attention to your mental health as well. We have a question in the Q&A box that asks, would you rec recommend working on other spots on campus? So I guess like, would you recommend along with the campus newspaper, like maybe joining other extracurriculars or taking other jobs that are not necessarily related? Yeah, definitely. I actually did have a work study job while I was still working at the free. I mean, of course, for pocket money and stuff like that. But I liked that it was an opportunity to not think about journalism in any capacity, whether it was in the classroom or um, you know, just writing for the newspaper and even later on with my internships, it was good to have a place to just go for a couple hours a week and only have to think about data entry. <laughs> and yeah, that was nice. And I tried to join a couple of clubs around campus, like the, there's the Filipino Student Union. I know there's a lot of great groups along, around campus that, you know, people I was friends with are part of. And that's something I probably wanted to do a little bit more if, you know, time were if we just had more time but yeah there's definitely try to balance and do other things that you're interested in because like your entire life doesn't just have to be journalism yeah i couldn't agree with that more i think the more life experiences you have and the more perspectives you get um outside of your newspaper um ultimately make you a better journalist and like mina said it is incredibly helpful to have a place where you don't need to think about journalism because again like this work is very heavy and it's very hard and very time consuming there was a point last year where i just like started bartending because i was like i need a place that i just that is just the complete opposite of what i'm doing and then ultimately my idea was like i'll meet more people you know i'll have more conversations that will then like give me more perspective um on the world so and I wish I did a lot more in BU. Um, I wish that I balanced my time more and joined more clubs and maybe, you know, got another like job on the side. Uh, you know, I understand the time constraints because of how much time this takes up. But yeah, I mean, just go, you should, you should see the world as much as you can. And if you do, you'll just be a better journalist for it. And another question asks about majors or minors. Um, so I know that a bunch of, people working in journalism did major in journalism, but it's not always the case. Do you guys feel like there um, are any other majors that could be helpful? Or like, what do you guys think about the need to major in journalism to work in this kind of field? Yeah, it's definitely not necessary. I mean, I definitely met a lot of people through the free, you know, who were coming on as staff writers or eventually became editors who weren't journalism majors. So 
whether they were English or political science. We actually had a really good staff writer while I was an editor who was a philosophy major and we he was very solid. We used him a lot because he enjoyed writing and just being out there. Um, even things like, you know, economics or even like if you're in STEM or business, like if you enjoy writing and talking to people and, you know, are able to work hard, that definitely counts for something. And especially if you're going into like, you want to go into a certain type of journalism, whether it's like science or business and economics, like maybe kind of blending those two majors would be super helpful. Like I know it's like some of the science people like actually do have science backgrounds, whether it's like biology or chem, but yeah, you can really anyone could join and I'm sure be successful in journalism and whatnot. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a call. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to major in journalism. I mean, it was ultimate, like I made, you know, four years out of college, there's one professor, professor that I'm, I'm still in touch with who I think was, um, was really great and made me a better journalist. But that's, you know, I just, I think everything that I learned from journalism came from working at the Daily Free Press and then working at the Boston Globe, both as a co-op and an intern. And like, you, this is a job that you learn as you go. Um, and yeah, it's helpful to learn like certain things in like your media law and ethics class, but that's also stuff that you can like, if you're motivated enough can like kind of learn on your own. Um, I tried being like a international relations double major with journalism and then ultimately like again the freak took up so much time that I think I only ended with like a concentration in IR if that. I wish I flipped it. I wish I did a major in international relations because that's um, a subject area I'm very interested in and then maybe like minored in journalism but still worked for the daily free press. Um, I think I probably would have had the same outcome um, but just, you know, a wider breadth of knowledge on a, on a different topic. Very interesting because I'm actually trying to double major in journalism and IR too. And I'm just, I was also thinking about like which one I should prioritize in case I don't have time. But yeah, that's very insightful. Um, so another question asks, what's the best way to get an internship? So how did you guys land your first internships? Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess my first, I guess, I mean, it's not technically an internship, but I also did the Boston Globe co-op. That was my first non-free journalism experience. And that was definitely through learning about it through word of mouth and just the history of other free people coming into the program, doing so well in it. And the editors on at the Globe recognizing that, you know, we are a solid crop of students who can do good work. I am um, through the and then I did the State House program through BU, Trisha did as well. Um, we have a really good professor, Jerry Berger, who runs it. And I thought that was a great thing because I'm interested in politics and state politics. Um, but I think the main thing is just, if you have any connections, definitely see if you can, um, they might be able to make an introduction for you or just maybe try to learn more from them about you know, what kind of environment you're going into, what kind of work you could be doing that's how I also ended up getting my first job but um yeah just and then also just just apply for it like the worst thing that could happen is you don't get it and that's obviously sad if you you know if you're excited about something and you don't get it but you'll never know because after graduation I I applied for an internship at the Los Angeles Times and they're of course they get million thousands of applications a year and I'm like, this isn't gonna happen. But they called me back and they're like, you're one of four people we're considering as finalists for the State House Bureau. And I'm like, that's not possible. Okay, I ended up getting it. It was like the greatest thing that ever happened to me, but I wouldn't have done it if I just didn't apply sort of thing. So you also have to have faith in yourself too and just put yourself out there. But that's kind of what I did, yeah. Yeah, mine was mine was similar um, with the, with the, with the Globe co-op and subsequent internship that was, you know, daily free press, word of mouth, and just applying. And they were they were partial toward people who had worked at the daily free press as well. Um, another, so similar to Mina with the LA Times, I blindly applied to USA Today. I think it was my junior year or something like that. Um, and they were like, uh, they got back to me and 
Well, so let me back up. So I didn't have any connections there. And I always think that applying into these portals is like a big black hole and you won't like ever hear back from them. So I like sought out an old intern on Twitter and like messaged him and was like, hey, like how did you get this internship? And then he was like, um, I connected with this reporter on the inside who has nothing to do with the internship program, but she's just really nice and, you know, just talk to her and then maybe she can help you. So I like didn't have any pre-existing connections there, but I had sort of forged my way in by just like blindly reaching out to people. And then I reached out to the reporter. She had no idea who I was. Um, I talked to her for maybe 10 minutes. She took a liking to me and then she put in a good word. And then two days later, I got a call from the hiring editor who was like, okay, well, we like you, but you applied really late and we don't have any like positions open where I applied, which was for the national desk. And he was like, but do you like tech reporting? And I had no interest in tech reporting, but I had a huge interest in being at USA Today. So I was just like, sure, like, why not? And so that goes to my point of just like, it's important to be open to different types of reporting and experiences um, because then at least you have your foot in the door. So then I um, ended up doing that tech internship and then they had an opening for the fall for their national reporting internship. So then I was, then I like slipped in, I applied for that and was also given preference because they already knew me. Um, so yeah, and then that happened a couple of other times with other internships where they didn't have the position that I had applied for open, but they offered me another one. And though it was something that I wasn't initially interested in, I took it anyways. And then while I was inside, would then kind of work my way toward what I wanted to actually be doing. Yeah, and you guys have both held jobs at a variety of news outlets by now. Um, so when and how do you make the decision to like switch to a new publication? Um, what, what factors into accepting a new job yeah so I'm on my second job now since graduation I graduated in 2017 so it's been about three years now um, I think honestly most it got to the point where you know I was wasn't feeling less challenged but also there was just life things to consider too like am I able to pay my rent like is this like is this job actually like letting me make a living so that I can live sort of thing. So that was a big um, motivator and why I ended up applying for the enterprise. But you know, yeah, it was, it kind of just felt like it was time to move on. And I was there for a year and a half. And in that year and a half span, six of months was spent at a weekly newspaper. And then I switched over to the daily. So it definitely felt like I was climbing each time. And that'll probably be my goal, you know, whenever I decide to move on from this job, just, you know, maybe a bigger city, maybe a beat, settling just into one beat that I'm interested in, but I'm always trying to aim upwards. Cause I don't know if there's, you know, it's still possible to like find a job at one place and stay there for like 40 years at this point. Maybe if, you know, in the future, but for now, like I'm definitely open to hopping around and maybe even like, you know, leaving New England altogether. Yeah, so I had a lot of internships, which had their natural conclusion. The Chronicle has been the only job that I've that I've had uh, out of school, um, but I've held two positions in there. And my uh, so I started as business and then moved to City Hall, which felt like a whole different job. And it felt like a step up um, from what I was doing before. Um, shortly after, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, staying in one place for or at one beat for at least like a year or two. I mean, when I moved to City Hall a year in, I still didn't feel like I had a good handle on it and I still didn't feel like I did and got what I could have out of it. Um, I was actually offered two other jobs um, shortly after I had um, moved to City Hall and on paper they were like, without a doubt, a step up, but I had actually had I actually said no to them because I felt like there was just so much more I could do at the Chronicle with City Hall and it would make me even stronger to then move on later. Um, so yeah, and I mean, the Chronicle is just like, it's in a great city, it's treated me very well. Um, I think I'm paid fairly. So I don't 
have like an immediate desire to to move um but i have decided recently that i would be open to looking elsewhere so i've just started doing like very casual um you know emails and twitter dms to other reporters i know at other papers just to kind of like feel put feelers out and and see what's out there and i think that's kind of an ideal like way to start looking where you're not like desperate to leave so you can kind of wait for the opportunity to um to come to you and you're not just taking something for for the sake of for the sake of taking it but yeah i think you just kind of have to listen to yourself and decide like are, did you did you do like me i said did you do everything that you could do that do at this place is there still room to move up etc and we have two questions about beats so um when you kind of find your beats like do you seek them out or do they come to you? And how do you handle changing beats? So far, my experience has been, you know, the beats has been part of the job, so I haven't gotten to choose them. Like with the papers, um, my first job, it was a geographical beat. So you're covering a few towns or a city. Um, I started off covering like four small towns and we, you know, would basically have to cover everything under the umbrella of like going to their government meetings, keeping an eye on schools, businesses, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and breaking news all on top of it. But I have more recently transitioned to um, topics. So like I said, I do cover health. I also cover a little bit of state government and greatly enough animals. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, in that case, I got a little more, you know, freedom over picking that the types of beats I was, I wanted to report on. And it helped that I'm definitely interested in these things. Health wasn't something that was on my radar, but my, you know, my editors thought like it was something that I was strong at, so they wanted to, you know, give it to me. And I'm glad it's worked out. Um, I got, you know, a chance to do some of that reporting before the pandemic hit, so at least I wasn't like super green when coronavirus came around. But yeah, it's definitely I. I like the subject matter better, but I'm sure like, you know, if you live in a big city, like there's definitely a lot more opportunities to kind of delve into some of the other stuff involved there. If that makes any sense. Um, yeah, when I first came to the Chronicle, I was, uh, uh, I was general assignment on the business desk, uh, which was, which was pretty difficult because it was like, you can cover, like, I always find general assignment to be kind of difficult without like a sub beat because like you could you basically have like the whole world at your fingertips and it's like you're almost paralyzed by all the options you have and like what you can cover so you're like well what should i like sink my teeth into and you don't really like generate like you generally don't become like an expert on one subject matter but you you get to know a lot of different things so some people love general assignment i never really loved doing it i've always preferred having a beat but i carved out my own beat um on the business desk, I found that, uh, you know, no one was covering uh, work-based immigration, which are like H-1B visas um, that are very common all over the U.S. at BU and in Silicon Valley in particular. And this was in 2016 when Trump was like doing all these horrible things to, to visas. Um, and so, yeah, I carved out my beat, beat for that and it ended up getting um, national attention which was which was really exciting where you know you find sort of a local you find a hole in in the coverage and then general assignment gives you the opportunity to kind of fill that in so i did that and then when i moved to city hall um that beat was given to me i covered the 11 uh, board of supervisors but even with that i've covered i've carved out my sub beat of um homelessness and mental health it's a topic i obviously care a lot about and it's a huge topic in San Francisco so you know I always find it helpful to have like some sort of focus and some sort of some area that you can kind of become like a mini expert on um, which is good so yeah even if you're given a general assignment there's always opportunity to cry to carve out like your own uh, areas of expertise yeah and um, so there's one question that says how do you keep all your skills fresh when you're working a specific beat so like do you find that um there's a difference in the skills that you have to use when you're doing general assignment as compared to a certain beat yeah, I, 
Yeah. Um, I was actually talking to someone about this the other day. The chat, like when I was general assignment, uh, and especially when I was learning about immigration, it was, you know, the sources I had uh, were either in DC and the people I was writing about were, you know, far away from me, like physically, where, and like, you know, and there was like so many different people you could reach out to for on the topic of work-based immigration, where writing about San Francisco City Hall, a skill set I had to very quickly develop was relationship management. Um, there is 11, there are 11 supervisors and like I need to talk to them all day. And before the pandemic, I was, I had an office in City Hall. So it's like, if you wrote something and it pissed someone else, someone off, you would need to, you know, be prepared to like possibly run into them on the way to the bathroom, you know, and you, you, I, you always have to be really careful because like you do need this person for information. So how do you balance, you know, writing something about them that might not be that flattering, but still have them respect you enough where they will still come to you with information and pick up your calls. Um, I think that's been a re like that relationship management has been a very important skill to learn. Um, and the way that I have approached it has always been, you know, just be, never let anyone really be surprised about what you're writing. So if I'm writing something about, um, you know, a supervisor that won't be that flattering, like I will tell them so they know and I will give them a fair chance to respond. Um, and, you know, it's a very scary thing. I don't think I was that good at doing that in the beginning, but I've since learned that that is like probably one of the most important skill sets that you can you can have and, and to work on. Um, so, you know, as you're writing for the Daily Free Press or whatever internships, like kind of learning how to keep those relationships um, is a good skill to work on. Yeah, I agree too. Um, it's de I've definitely noticed the difference between being more general assignment versus working a beat. Like at least, you know, within my beats, I'm kind of going back to some of the similar people. Like I know the spokespeople at the hospitals, like I know who all our state reps and um, senators are for our coverage area in terms of covering state politics. So, I mean, those are some of the similar faces and at least I've gotten some sort of, built some sort of report with them so that like, you know, I can call them up, I can send them an email and usually things come, where we have a pretty good working relationship. I've noticed with working general assignment, that's definitely, you're definitely working with a lot more, you know, average normal people. So let's say like, you know, it's a mom or a dad in the community who's doing something. They may have never like spoken with a reporter before and don't know how to, you know, act and they might be nervous and that's fine. That's something that, you know, I expect to happen and kind of talk with them a little differently than I would someone, you know, who's a PR professional or like, a politician or you know someone who works in town government and like actually is expecting to have to answer these sort of questions but yeah it definitely relationship management and also just keeping in mind of like who you're talking to because obviously I'm not going to treat like a grandma who's never talked to a reporter before the same way as I would someone who's been in the state office for like 40 years. It's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> But journalism is a notoriously tough industry to succeed in. Um, so during your college career, was there ever a point where you just like feared that you wouldn't get an internship or you wouldn't get a job after graduation? And how do you deal with those feelings? Yeah, it was definitely frustrating. Like, you know, during applying for internships, like summer for junior year and after graduation, like, you know, sending out like the fort, I think I sent out like 30 applications for internships. Obviously only heard from like w the ones that I got, but the, I guess the only way I've got through it is that I had to be like, like it's not the end of the world. Like even if you don't get hired by someone, like you still have something to offer and you still need to keep trying. Cause if, you know, if I just shut down and like refuse to like move on, then that's not gonna be good for me. And you know, there could be an opportunity out there that I just haven't found yet. And that was also similar for applying for jobs. Like I think I sent like 20 job applications and I did go through a couple of interviews that, you know, looked promising, but you know, they ended up falling through for reasons like, you know, oh, we can't hire right now because of our budget. Like I could tell that the editors liked me, but it just like wasn't the right timing or 
that sort of something that was out of their control. But, you know, just had to think like, I just got to keep going and it's going to be okay. And thankfully, you know, there's a lot more young people like in their 20s and stuff getting into journalism. So that's good to see more familiar faces, at least age wise, there's more women, there's more people of color and minorities getting in. So that's always good to see too. And it, I would like to be, you know, help encourage future people who want to be a part of this because they, we need it. Like we, we should be here. We should be at the table and doing the work too, because, you know, there's, there's might be some people out there who might be more comfortable talking to someone who they share a culture with, they share a gender with, or an identity with, and they may not be telling their story just because, you know, they don't feel comfortable talking to a straight white guy sort of thing. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. So um, this is obviously like a really tough industry for a lot of people. Um, was there ever a point where you feared that you wouldn't get an internship in time or you wouldn't get a job after graduation? Oh, yes. Every year I went through this trauma. Um, and I feel like I always got an internship or my job finally at like the very, very last minute. Um, yeah, I feel like it was always a cycle of like, you know, I would come off the high for my summer internship and then these like deadlines to apply again come up really quickly. And then it would just be sort of this role of people not answering or, you know, getting rejected. And then that would go well until the spring. And then the spring you're starting to be like, oh, I'm not going to be a journalist. Um, something always works out if you're, if you're patient and you do your due diligence. Um, but yeah, like it, I went through this every single year. Um, I think I applied to the LA Times internship and, and wasn't as lucky as me to, to hear back from them. Um, you know, but, and even when I was applying for a job, uh, after I graduated, I had the Globe internship and then um, I couldn't get a job. I really just wanted to get a job there um, and that didn't work out. And then, um, then I took another internship at the Wall Street Journal that I got because like another intern had dropped out and they were like, you're next in line. Uh, and they were like, also do you like tech? And I was like, sure. And then, so I came out here, um, but then I, it was basically this 12 week crunch of like, okay, if I don't find a job by the end of this internship, I'm gonna be unemployed. The day the internship ended, I think I got the job at the Chronicle. So it's like, very stressful but you my biggest advice is just to like have as many you know cultivate as many like connections as you can because ultimately it was a connection that I created at the Wall Street Journal that helped me get the the Chronicle job um so you know if you're doing things like if you you know have your portfolio up to date you're reaching out to people you're doing your due diligence like something will work out and everyone who came before you has had someone that has helped them get to where they are. So don't be afraid to just blindly reach out to people. I think in the last like eight years of me like cold emailing people, I've had two people I can remember who were not receptive to me and they can just, you know, they, who cares about them, right? Um, but yeah, so yes, it is always difficult, but if you're patient and care about this, job just try as hard as you can not to get discouraged and just understand that something will work out eventually yeah and another question asks about um pitching local stories so um at your publications do you do you find that most of your stories are assigned to you or do you get to bring up story ideas to, to pitch and what kind of stories do you guys like to pitch yeah, I think it's probably at least 50-50. Like sometimes I'll, I mean, sometimes I just need to help out or like, you know, write up this press release about a car crash or a fire. And of course I'll do it. But if there's, there's things that are in my beat, my editors see around, they'll forward it to me. Be like, this could be a good idea, you know, get, do it when you have time. I like to pitch stories that definitely have a feature element to it. I really do enjoy feature writing, but still like combining it with, you know, like data or like um, reports and like, you know, certain things. Like there was this one story I pitched that I really enjoyed working on in the health area. Um, I had read this study, I think it was like just a wire story from like AP, but they mentioned that 
more people are dying at home now these days, like instead of in a hospital or in a facility or whatnot. And I noticed that the author was from our local VA and I'm like, oh, that could be interesting. I could talk to him. And then I knew that I had a contact at the local hospice place. So I wanted to ask her, like, do you have any patients you could connect me with who are like made this decision and they're going to go through with, you know, dying at home. And we ultimately found a woman who, you know, has stage four breast cancer and made the decision. And it's just, you know, living comfortably until she passes. But it was really great to be able to hear from her. And I, we got these great stories. Like she was so happy with the story. I don't even know if she's alive anymore, but I, that was something I really enjoyed, you know, pitching and I'm glad it got, went through my editor saw it and it turned out well too. But yeah, I like to look for some sort of narrative element. And also of course, thinking about pictures too, you know, cause that also has the potential of making a story good, but it could be something more long-term too. Like I've done, so I like went across all our towns and like requested the dog licensing records. Cause I just wanted to know what the most popular dogs were in our area because I cover animals too. And that, that's something that I pitched and they totally were on board with me doing, even though it involved a lot of working on the spreadsheets themselves. Like it took like weeks to finish, to clean everything up. But, you know, I try to think of some things that are fun like that, some things that are a little more serious. Sometimes I'll write about a bill in the state house, but usually most of my pitches like will go through, which is helpful. <laughs> what was the most popular dog? Uh, it had to be like a golden retriever or like a shepherd or something like one of the pe ones people like actually do like and I think like Brady was like one of the most popular names of course because Massachusetts yeah um yeah so when you're on a beat uh you know you're the one with your eyes and ears on the ground so a lot of the stories come from uh, come from me. Um, you know, I'll have sources call me obviously with their own agenda. I had someone call me at seven this morning who was like, oh, I have a story idea for you. And I was like, okay. And it actually was a good story idea. So when you like cultivate these, these relationships um, with people, people know to come to you uh, with story ideas. And again, you always have to take them with a grain of salt because if they're coming to you and if they're a politician, they have an agenda in mind. So you need to be really, that was something I, you know, was a, a huge kind of like a huge learning curve for me of like knowing who to sort of trust when I came into city hall. Um, but yeah, so a lot of them are generated from, from me, from sources calling me, uh, you know, but for stuff like, like today, I'm working on a story that's out of my beat um, on what it's like to evacuate a wildfire during a pandemic. And that one was assigned to me. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a mix. Um, and sometimes my editor, you know, will see a story that was written in another paper that we missed and she'll be like, we need something on this up now. And so, but mostly it's, it's coming, it's coming from me. And what are your favorite and least favorite parts of working in local journalism? Got to think about that. Yeah, my favorite part is that you're like part of the community. Um, at least with the Chronicle, like there's still like a lot of readership. Um, you know, it's generally older, but you are starting to see it as they're like, you know, as the Chronicle is like really expanding its online coverage, it's like slowly skewing a little and a little younger and San Francisco is just like a very engaged um, uh, city. So yeah, I really do like with local journalism how like you write something sometimes and you can see the direct result of your reporting, um, especially in City Hall, like, you know, I wrote something about there being like a lot of shelter bed vacancies and like a week later there was like an online bed tracking tool. So you can see that there's like this clear cause and effect. Um, you know, when you're writing about people who are around you, um, which you don't necessarily get with um, working at a national paper. Um, you know, the frustrations are kind of the obvious. Sometimes the resources aren't there. Um, you know, I, like I had this great opportunity, uh, you know, great in journalism terms. I was following this homeless guy who had died in San Francisco and then the family had invited us to a fu his funeral in South Carolina. And like, I thought it was this amazing opportunity to show like these people have families and they're multifaceted and have people who care about them. Um, and the only reason I couldn't go was because the paper couldn't afford my 
like thousand dollar round trip like with everything from food and you know hotels included so it's just like you know the resources aren't always there um i think at the chronicle they're definitely there more than they are at other local papers um and it's also like the platform you know we can we could be following a story for months and won't get much traction but then like the new york times picks it up and then now suddenly everyone knows about it which is just frustrating but you know it's important to maybe they wouldn't have known about that story had we not been covering it um you know so diligently so yeah i mean the positive is that you're part of the community you can see the impact frustration is just resources and platform aren't as big as they would be at a bigger paper yeah i agree i mean with my first job i did live in the community that i covered and i definitely noticed a difference between I guess how much I felt invested just by, you know, virtue of being a resident and like, you know, this is the park I go to, this is the gym I go to, these are, I'm doing some of the same things that my readers are doing. These days, like I don't live in Brockton, but you know, I still definitely feel invested, you know, in the city and surrounding areas. I, you know, find myself rooting for them and, you know, want to see them do well. And, you know, even if bad things happen, I'm like, oh, that's a shame, but you know, it is what it is. But yeah, definitely resources. It can be a little um, frustrating, especially at a smaller paper. Um, in my previous job, at one point they took away our whole newsroom. So that was very frustrating. So I, I've actually had experience with work from home before the pandemic was even a thing. Cause like I would just be at my kitchen table or in the library or at a coffee shop attempting to talk to people, even though the coffee grinders are really loud, but and obviously the New York Times has a very nice office and most newsrooms do, but it is what it is. I mean, you definitely have to make do with what you have, but I've definitely enjoyed my time here. <laughs> yeah, and lately, I feel like it's been really trendy for people to say the press isn't covering this, even though local journalists are covering everything. Um, have you guys dealt with these kind of sentiments? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you get that, you get that all the time of people who just like didn't see the story or, you know, didn't read past the headline. That's a very common sentiment, but like, you can't really do anything to control people's ignorance. Like, all you can do is just do your job as well as you can and as honestly as you can and be thorough. And that's, you know, that's all you can really do. Yeah, no, that, that is a real thing. I, it's one thing that, I mean, kind of goes back to resources, but sometimes, you know, we'll get people who reach out or like, why aren't you covering X, Y, and Z? And it's like a big national story. And like, yes, we have, you know, stories from the AP or the New York Times, like posted in our newspaper just about the thing, but it seems that they're mad at like me personally for not like living in Washington, D.C. and covering President Trump personally. And obviously like that's, not a realistic thing. Like we don't have a DC bureau. I don't live in DC. Like I can't do that. But I mean, it is what it is. Like, I mean, I'm not gonna engage and kind of argue back because sometimes it's just not worth it. There's a really interesting question in the Q&A box that says, do you consider journalism activist work or are they always two separate things? That is a good question. Um... I think some time, mm, that's a very good question. I think journalism, yes. I mean, you are in a way, like it is a form of activism, like you're, ac you're advocating for the truth, for politicians to be spending people's monies honestly, money honestly, for them, you know, your officials to be like actually looking out for people for the right reason. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's definitely a form of advocating, um, you know, for the people in the communities that you cover. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even though I don't see myself personally as an activist, there's, you mean, at least in my personal life, there's definitely some overlap I might, tendencies I might have, you know, outside of journalism, but I can see how I, why some people would like kind of mix the two up because it does seem like it's, you know, more on one side or like it's supporting something, but yeah, I mean, if you're trying to do do right by people, I'm 
I mean, I'm fine to be doing, having that as part of my job. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have time for today. So thank you to so much for joining us. Um, and Trisha, I'll let you go back to reporting. Um, thank you so much to the participants for also tuning in for this last speaker session. And everything um, that has been recorded will be up either today or tomorrow and we'll email it out to you guys. So yeah, thank you everyone so much for coming. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thanks.